the top 20 most frequently asked questions by newbies about wholesaling. Hello Facebook, this is Ty aka The Flip Man. Last week I gave you 1 through 5. This week I'm giving you 6 through 10 from my most recent Flippinar. So sit back, enjoy the video, like it, please share it, tap learn more, let's get it. top 20 most frequently asked questions by newbies about wholesaling houses, six through 10. So we'll go ahead with number six. Remember the podcast, you see the logo there that uh, this will be uploaded to the podcast probably by tomorrow, no later than Saturday, if you want to go back through this, or if you want to recommend someone, if you have an Apple, a product, a smartphone, iPhone or iPad. I'm gonna eventually get it there for Android because there are more Android users than iPhone users. Um, I'm an iPhone user, so that's probably why I chose it first or whatever, because I could test it. But I'll get it there, so just wanted to say that before I get to number six. Now, I did number one through five last week, so if you didn't get uh, last week, you can go back and view that um on last week so that would have been the 13th on that particular uh flipinar so uh, how do i find deals obviously this is this question i, I really can't because i it, it this is several videos uh that i have on my channel to answer this question though so i'm gonna be a little vague here so understand that you can obviously go back and go to my channel and go through this but so obviously this is probably one of the the, the, if it's not the main question, it's up there. It's the number one or two. How do I find deals? All right, there are free ways and there are paid ways to do it. Uh, the free ways, and, and you all get tired of me saying this probably, uh, students and non-students, is that don't sleep on properties that are being listed for rent, whether offline or online. Because even with banded signs, direct mail, social media, internet, or whatever, if you had to group the types of motivated sellers that are going to probably turn into deal, deal uh, sellers that are going to turn into deals, the group with the highest number of people calling you and why they want to sell is going to be landlords, tired landlords. Either they got in over their head, they're simply just tired of deal, dealing with tenants, not paying them, having to evict, having to go back and repair the property, then finding a new tenant, screening that tenant, and then placing them in there, just going through that. Obviously, people do it because there's money to be made if you have the patience and the management skills to deal with it. But these individuals, for you as a wholesaler, turn into money because a lot of times they do not want to fix it anymore or as I said, as I said before, they got in over the head of what I meant by that. Most people, uh, the only thing they know about real estate investing, hey, I'm going to buy some houses and rent them out. That is not as easy as it sounds. Just like some people want to open a restaurant, oh, I'm going to buy, I'm a good cook, I'm just going to uh, buy, uh, rent a building and start selling wings or, or soul food or whatever. You know, that's a, that's a method to the science. A uh, method to the madness, I mean. Same thing with being a landlord and a tenant. Now, you can get lucky and um, find some good tenants, and they just pay you every money, pay you for years. But for everybody, it doesn't work that way. And then you can always find a tired landlord that's uh, tired in the sense that he's tired of making money, <laughs> and he's just ready to retire. Uh, so land tired landlord, so vacants, vacant properties. Now, with vacant properties, there are going to be a couple of things there. Now, sometimes vacant park properties, depending on the market that you're in, and what I'm discussing right now are free methods. Vacant properties, uh, those are just going to be properties that are obviously vacant in most cases where the grass has grown up or a combination of the grass has grown up and the front door is open and the window's busted out, obviously, uh, or it's boarded up. So a lot of times they just stick out like a sore thumb. Now, with vacant properties, you, you want to only probably deal with on a block. There's one of two, maybe three houses that are vacant, but everything else is lively. Even though it may be uh, 
quote unquote a war zone or a hood area, however you want to title it, whatever misconception or, or perception people have about those type of areas. Um, you still want it to be in an area where the neighbors tend to care about their street or their block because you have to think in the terms of an actual investor, they are going to see the same thing that you see if you see people hanging out on the street corner, trash everywhere. Even though if a lot of people live on the street and there's only one or two vacant houses, it's still a thing we call curb appeal. It still looks presentable that a family may want to move there if they consider living in this particular type of area, whether it's uh, a blue collar, uh, a lower middle class, middle class, and obviously on up the scale. So vacant properties. Now with a vacant property, obviously you got to do the due diligence. Unless it's one of those states where the tax information is not public information, the tax bill has to go somewhere. And so I think they call it a non-disclosure state. But the tax bill has to go somewhere. So if the mailing address of the, the, the owner of the property is different from the actual uh the, the, the property that you're targeting, then um, then that's going to probably be an opportunity to send out a piece of mail. I hope you find someone that's motivated. All right, we'll go ahead to listed property. Now, those are properties that are actually listed with real estate agents, agents now. As I said, with all of these methods, I, I have videos that go into detail, but just briefly, with a listed property with a realtor, that's a different process dealing with a realtor. First, you have to understand that the realtor has got to feed his family first. You can't get mad at them on that. Now, they'll say, I'm professional. I'm going to look out for my client, blah, blah, blah. Okay, maybe so. You're still going to be worried about feeding your family first. All right, so with that being said, you have to understand you got to play the game they play. And you will be no different. The more they sell it for, the more money they make. So to curtail some of that, to try to, to remove some of that, you don't need your own realtor. You need, if you're gonna target listed property, property that are on MLS, contact the actual listed agent, because now you give them an opportunity to double dip, to get the full commission, but they're already gonna to have to split it with a broker, so they don't have to split it with an agent and a broker. And what I mean by that, no, we'll just say they normally, most listed is 6%. So instead of them splitting with an agent and only getting 3%, then spending it with their broker, they get the entire 6% and split it with their broker. So that's the first thing. But the other thing is, when dealing with an agent, they like to try to pre-screen buyers by, they want to see if you're serious, um, understand that they're going to want probably a minimum of $500 earnest money, a lot of times 1000 and then they may want proof of funds. So if you're going to deal in that arena, which is free to do it if you know what you're doing, and there's opportunities there, then boom, there you go. Now also now listed properties, there's no secret about them because they're advertised everywhere, but there is an opportunity if you can negotiate a cheap enough deal that you may have something there if you have the right type of buyer. All right, so let's go into the paid methods and I don't have to get into these too deep. Obviously you guys know I love banning signs. You know, nothing works better than those if done correctly, just because of the number of eyeballs that you can get to your message for basically a couple of hundred dollars. The reg mail is good. It can be more, um, less of a shotgun approach than bandit signs, but it costs more, takes more patience, and you have to be more consistent with it, even with bandit signs. Obviously with bandit signs, they'll come down up, so you always put them out. Now, social media slash the internet, still a work in progress on the social media. Uh, I'm gonna figure it out though. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm going to figure it out, but that some of you all may have already, but I have to may, I have to mention that because you're not, you're kidding yourself if that's not a part of any business. I don't care what you're doing, and you have to take that in consideration when you're doing your marketing and advertising to get to find deals. All right, so that's number six. Number seven is should I have an attorney? All right, so you have to ask yourself what is the purpose now. A lot of, um, uh, and I only know this because people tell me this and this sounds like seminar stuff. Uh, they'll tell you, you need to have your team before you start. Have you an attorney, have you a realtor, have your title company ready, have your contractor uh, or and an appraiser, have your team ready. All sounds good. They try to complicate it more so than what they need to. 
similar to not having your own realtor for wholesaling. We're just talking about houses, really even commercial. Uh, a, a real, a, a, an attorney is really not necessary because even if you don't want to use the contract that I have available, you can pay an attorney to create your contract if you wanted to, if you want to waste that money, <laughs> in my opinion. I'm not an attorney, but I just think it's a waste, man. This contract is simple. Just keep it simple. You know, because you're using cash, you eliminate a lot of the clauses that agents and attorneys will put in there. You're buying as is, you're closing in a short time frame. It just eliminates all that garbage in there, man. But again, you have to do what you're comfortable with. So you have to ask yourself, for what purpose are you acquiring an attorney for? Because contracts, even if you just want to use the standard realtor's contract in your market, you can do that uh, if you wanted to, because um, and that's tested legally. It's been tested over time. If you're not comfortable like using the one page contract that I give away. So if you want to pay an attorney to create your attorney, the only thing he's going to do, and hopefully you're choosing a, a real estate attorney, not just some blow Joe on the corner somewhere that does anything that comes his way. If you're going to do uh, that, then uh, he's probably just going to go to his software and print you off a contract, charge you $500 to $1,000. Boom. I guess that makes you happy. Boom. So just me, my two cents. And then with closings, you know, that's really the only reason that you're in a state where only title companies can close the deals. Uh, the closing attorney, you know, you may use several, you know, and then a lot of times you won't dictate that anyway because your buyer would dictate that. So, so should I have an attorney? I'm going to say no. Now, if a situation arises, uh, uh, presenting itself where you need to defend yourself for whatever reason, then yeah, you, but you do that on what we would say standby or as needed depending on what the situation is. So I'm going to say no. All right, will I have to pay taxes? Well, uh, that's a common question that I get. Obviously, it's made the top 20 here. <laughs> um, it's income. And you want to be a legitimate business or entity, it's income, which means, yes, you're going to have to pay taxes on income. So some people are like, wow, I don't want to do that, blah, blah. I say, I'm, I, I don't get that. So you rather, you rather not pay taxes and do zero income or to make 150 grand and pay taxes on 150 grand. So even if you had to pay 40% of that, which is a high number, other things you can do with just using easy math here. So what is 40% of that? What is that? Uh, 60,000. So you keep 90,000 out of that just as uh, some easy math. All right. So would you rather have zero or you have 90 grand in your bank account? All right. So with taxes, people say, well, what do you do? Well, I don't answer that question. I, well, let me just say, I do answer the question, but I always answer the same. Seek out a CPA. I'm not going to give you any advice on that because I've been jacked up on taxes because I can be hard-headed sometimes or whatever, but you need to seek out a CPA. I have one. She's a personal friend of mine. She does not do taxes for individuals. She just does my taxes. A, lady, a girl that I went to college with, she's an she's a executive at a large regional bank. Uh, she, she's in their tax department. But she just does my tax because we've been friends ever since I've been in Birmingham, 27 plus years. All right, but you know she's a licensed CPA, the whole nine. She, you know, you know, she knows it. That's her. That's her business. But my advice to you is to seek out a CPA. But to answer your question, will I have to pay taxes? Yes, you will have to pay taxes, and you should want to pay taxes. All right, do I need an LLC to start? If you, well, this is a tricky one for me because I know I'm a renegade. But to answer the question, no, you don't. There's no law that says you have to, but you do want to set up a business at as soon as you can. Um, but I did, I did deals for the first three years without an LLC. You know, I wouldn't advise anyone to do that. But normally, the the reason I say that. Uh, and I advise a lot of students on this. 
is that a lot of times people don't have the money to do uh, to get educated if they had to pay for that. But assume they didn't have to pay for education; they just figured it out themselves. But to, to start a marketing plan um, and uh, doing an LLC, if you got to choose between the, getting your phone ringing to find deals or or putting up a website and all this stuff, I'm going to say do the deal, do one deal, and then you can start your LLC. It's not going to kill you to have one, two, three, a few deals in your name, you know, because you can always transition that over, you know. But again, that's what a CPA is for. So to answer the question, do I need an LLC to start? No. If it's if if you got to make a decision between buying some bandit signs, just using that as an example, or setting up the LLC, it's my opinion. Now you do however you want to. Uh, again, you don't need to be like me. I went three years right before I did something like that or whatever. But the right way to do it is to do it as soon as possible. Allow the first deal to fund that, or your second deal, or whatever depending on how much money, because it shouldn't cost that much money. In reality, I actually just did mine. My owner downloaded the, the, uh, the document from the state that handles that, uh, that uh, particular type of entity and followed the instruction and went down and registered and it cost roughly 100, well, I think 150 bucks. Um, so, you know, I, I wouldn't suggest you do that, but it had all the legal jargon you needed. You just basically filling out the blank. That's the way it is here. Maybe a little different in your state. So, but you know, you have attorneys out there now. Again, they go right to that software, print you out something. Basically, you're gonna fill out the same stuff, and they're just gonna put in the blanks. Bam! Here's your here's your bill for a grand or five hundred dollars or whatever. So, that's gonna be totally up to you on how you want to handle that. Some people may be more informed on that than me, because I know you can set up business entities and create credit and all that stuff. I don't know anything about that. You know, that's cool though. So um, do I need an LLC to start? I'm going to say yes and no, depending on what your resources are, because I'm more about while you're sitting there trying to get an LLC started, I'm worried, I want you to do some deals and then you can take care of the LLC after you make that money and you can add on to your marketing. That, that's just my thoughts on it. I'm not saying that's the right way to do it or whatever, but you're here because you want to hear my opinion on stuff. All right, number 10, are bandit signs illegal? Yes, yes, and yes. There's no question about that. There's not going to be a city. Uh, there's not going to be a state. There's not going to be a county that doesn't have ordinances on the books against yard signs slash bandit signs. But it's so funny that during political season, you see them everywhere. Hmm. The same people that are making and enforcing these laws, they're using bandit signs. Hmm. Generally what happens, and not all markets, but most, bandit signs will, you can get away with bandit signs normally in the areas where, as I mentioned, uh, the, the areas that you see on the news every night, right? And the reason that you probably can get away with it in most cases is because the city workers take them down a lot of times. Normally in those areas, they just have more important things than to worry about bandit signs. Now understand that if you use bandit signs in those areas, that's where a lot of your deals are going to come from. But I've made, a, most of the money I've made to come from those areas. I'm fine with the checks, still cash the same. The money definitely spends the same. So, but that's going to be other. So sometimes you have to get outside your comfort zone. Now you can be creative, and I know most people want to put signs where signs don't exist already. And sometimes you may be fortunate in that, and it may they may stay up because banner signs are a waste of your time if you don't get life out of them, meaning that they stay up. So, with that being said, when you're putting up actual signs, when you're putting up actual signs. Um, keep in mind, it's all about visibility. When you're creating your signs, keep it as simple as possible. I know you want to be different than everybody else. We buy houses, I buy houses. That's about all they can say in a phone number. Maybe a small print website or cash as is a smaller print or whatever, depending on the size sign you use. But you can't say much because people are reading from a distance. They're not looking for your message. 
So the larger your letters are, especially the main message, the more uh, the chances of your message being read increases greatly. All right? Copycat, uh, piggybacking. That's basically what I was saying is that normally you're going to put signs where other signs exist already. I know you say, well, I've seen four different phone numbers on a poll with signs. You should be number five. <laughs> McDonald's sell hamburgers. Wendy sell hamburgers. Burger King sell hamburgers. Hardee's. All of them will be clustered right there together. All over the country, you can see that. No different. You know, they, they call you. You pick up the phone. The other person they call, they may not pick up the phone. So there's enough money out there for everybody. But to answer the question, are bandit signs illegal? Yes, they are illegal. But I'm not telling you to do them. I'm not telling you what the consequences may be. I've been doing them. I've used them. I have made a lot of money with them. I know other people have done the same thing. So you have to make that judgment call on your own. But in most cases, in the areas where you already see signs in your market, you're going to be able to get away with them also. Now, you can be creative and try some areas where they don't exist already, see how it comes back. But again, you know, it's, it's all about getting life out of them. drive throughs work well, fast food drive throughs from the place where you pick up, sign, pick up the food, order the food, or exit the parking lot. It's all about visibility. All drive throughs are not equal, so some are fit, some won't. So, again, are banned signs illegal? Yes, they are. There's no question about that. So, this is 6 through 10. The top 20 most frequently asked questions by newbies about wholesaling houses. So, who has the first question? And we'll, we'll get going here. I see John has a question here. John DeWez. What is the best way to estimate how much damage to a house without getting an inspector to, to tell you how much it costs to fix it up? There are some simple methods of determining repairs, which I have a couple of videos on that, John. But basically, you'll break things down to 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, 25,000, so $5,000 increments. The video that I have on there, just look for it, this estimated repairs, wholesaling houses, and you should see that particular video because it goes into detail on how to do that. But you don't want to hire anyone to come out. That could get expensive every time that you want to estimate repairs on a property. There's no one number. It's just a, a ball. You just need a ballpark, especially in a wholesale position. You just need a ballpark number to know if you actually have a deal or not. So you don't need an actual inspector to, to do that. Next question. Someone says, put it on SoundCloud for Android use. Okay, I'll uh, do that, uh, MJ. All right, Joiner Tia says, if I can just do one deal a month, it would help me out so much. I agree. Most people, uh, that will do it for them. That's only 12 deals a year. That is so, so obtainable. I know it may seem hard and people are trying to do it. It's only going to take that first deal because that first deal is going to offer you so much flexibility in what you can do with your marketing that will basically pay for it for the remainder of the year. Jim Tim, did you sell the 346? Pending, as I mentioned last week. Eric, do you recommend eight and a half by 11 or 14 for your contract? I just do eight and a half by 11. Joiner, will all deals have to have equity in the property? Yes, uh, Joiner Tia. They always need equity. That's the only reason, and a lot of equity, that's the only reason that a cash buyer is going to be interested in the property because it gives them an opportunity to make money. If they're looking for a return on their investment and the risk from the risk that they've taken, you know, putting their money up. So it needs a lot of equity. So JG is learning sub subject to deals important as far as diversifying my streams of income and do you plan 
on making any bids on them in the future. No, I do not. Uh, that's not my actual thing. But to answer your question, it is a method that you can take advantage of to acquire property and to produce income. So I would strongly encourage you to pursue that. But I don't, it's not something that I've gotten, I've done like one or two of those deals over the 14 plus years I've been doing this. But it's nothing that I'll put a lot out there that I can see right now. And I, things could change, but as far as what I write now, no. Pamela Don says, has the police ever caught you putting out signs? If so, what did you say? I had one policeman tell me, say, hey, take that sign down and buy a billboard. I just took the sign down and went to another part of town. So to answer your question, he didn't have any, and he didn't have anything else to do that day. Jonathan Phillips said, does good equity on a house always mean? I'm not sure what you meant there, Jonathan. Go ahead and complete that uh, question. Tyler Stewart says, does all of your sellers own their property free and clear? If not, what's the ratio of people that do? No, uh, a lot of times people do have mortgages on the properties or liens or taxes. So no to answer your question, but a high number of properties that people call me about, they don't owe anything on them. Now I was told, I'm not sure if this factual or not, when I first got into business that 50% of the houses nationwide don't have any mortgages on them. I'm not sure how factual that is. Now that's, inc that's including pretty houses, junk houses and everything in between now. So the point I'm making is still a lot of opportunity out there. Jonathan Phillips says, does good equity always mean more money for me on a fee on closing day? Yes, sir. Uh, the more equity that's there, the more opportunity, more negotiating room that a seller may be willing to give up because they don't have to take in consideration a mortgage and nor taxes or liens. Eclipse Lawn Care says, can you explain what a joint venture consists of? It's basically someone partnering with you, whether it's uh, another wholesaler, it could be a buyer, it could even be a seller, and saying, hey, we're going to put this deal together, you're gonna bring whatever you bring to the table, I'm gonna bring whatever I bring to the table, we're gonna split it at this percentage. Sometimes it's 50, 50, maybe 70, 30, just whatever you agree upon. In most cases, put people will put something in writing to, to outline those terms of the joint venture. Maurice Quentin says, how often do you flip fire damage and foreclosures? Fire damage, I did one back in December, and I haven't done a lot of those, but if the opportunity presents itself, you'll have some people that love those because they can tear it down to the bare bones, but foreclosures, rare very rare i don't i don't pursue them so it's very rare it, that's a different that's a different ball game when you start talking about wholesale and foreclosure it's not it, the process doesn't work the same kevin jeter said my buyer wants to see the contract i have with the seller should i show the buyer my contract no <laughs> that is not necessary why does he want to see the contract that's the question you gotta ask him i'm not going to go and deal with a guy like that uh, Kevin, I'm just not. It's just, that's that's uh, he and I agree on a price, and that price works for him, and it works for me. Obviously, that's the only thing that should matter. I'm not going to deal with a cat like that. You need to find another buyer, in my opinion. Mr. Money CEO says wholesaling in the hood a good or a bad thing. I made 90 percent of my deals in the hood, so take that how you want. So I'm gonna say yes. Uh, Glenda Smith says I literally have read every thing and seeing a lot of videos. I'm kind of scared to get started, but I know I must, what can I do to start and be aggressive in this business? I say this, I know I say a lot of this stuff over and over again, but it's the answer is the answer. Linda, don't be afraid to make a mistake, uh, my friend. I still make mistakes. As I said, last summer I made a $6,000, but that was cause of greed, a rookie mistake. When I say six, I mean six out of my pocket. 
<laughs> that's what I mean by that. So don't be afraid that that's normally doesn't happen. It, it just was, it was stupid. I, it was stupid. But again, take action, Glenda. Sounds like you're very knowledgeable. The first thing you need to do, now I don't know if you have the budget for it, but you, it, the business gets simplified if you get people calling you versus you calling people. But if you don't have the resources to do that with either direct mail, banner signs, the internet, whatever, then just start simply targeting for rent signs, the generic rent signs that you see that are red and white or the black and white when someone bought at Walmart or at Home Depot or Lowe's and just call, start calling landlords and see if they're interested in selling the property. You, you'll call them and say, hey, uh, is the property still available? Whether they say yes or no, you let them know that, hey, I'm not calling about renting. I'm interested in buying the property. Would you be interested in selling it? If they say yes, obviously you take their information and you make you, you go from there. Do you do diligence on the problem that you have a deal? If they say no, you ask them, do you have a do you have any other deals that you any other houses that you may want to sell? So just take action. You know, sounds like you're you're knowledgeable. You're ready to rock and roll, baby girl. Take action. You know, you won't, you make a mistake, may get some egg on your face, a little embarrassment, but that's free. But the lesson that you learned, and I posted this on a comment earlier today, is going to be probably more valuable than anything that I can teach you because it comes from experience. All right, Eric says, thanks, man. We were talking soon. Thank you, Eric, for, for joining us tonight, man. Javier Munez, what do you think about holding? That should be everyone's goal is to hold on to real estate because that can set you up for your retirement because it's passive income, cash flow. Obviously, there's a degree of ma uh, management that goes involved into it, but you know, most definitely that should be your actual goal is to is to buy and hold. Now, that sets you up, you know, because at some point, if you have a loan on the property, whatever situation is paid down, that's just more cash flow for you. And allows you to be able to buy more properties, but that should always be be your goal. Mr. Gigi says, "Have you ever been in a situation where you had been forced to use a private money lender to fund a deal quickly to, due to the seller's lack of patience during the contract due diligence period on a house?" No, nah, I don't. You know, no. Nah, uh -uh. I just ask for more time. Either they're gonna give it to them or they don't. Because normally, if I can't find a buyer for it, I did a poor job of probably negotiating the deal. So they keep their earnings money. We, you know, we go our separate ways. Maurice Quinton said, "I want to know what the mistake was. I want to get. I, I won't get into that, man. It's, it's. It, well, let me just say that I, I can just tell you this. Um, I basically, I, I, I had an opportunity to probably make about twenty five thousand dollars on the property. The seller was antsy. My buyer was dragging his feet, and I, I basically depended on one buyer to do this because he's bought a lot of stuff from me." And so, but he was dragging his feet on it. So I didn't promote it the way I should. That's a rookie mistake. You don't ever do that. You don't ever depend on one buyer like that. And so the guy had a tax bill, the pass through tax bill that was due. And I went and paid it, you know, because the seller, I really had ran out of time, but I was confident that this buyer was going to, to go on a buy. So I went and paid the bill. It was, it was roughly six, six big ones. So my buyer didn't close, my time ran out, the seller didn't want to give me any more time. I lost the money. There you go. All right, the hen dog says, I have an agent that has sent me a list of 12 properties, all of which are short sales. Ooh, is this worth me trying to move forward and putting time into? What would you do? Well, I'm a bad person to ask on, you know, get their opinion on that as far as a short sale because they're so time consuming. As a matter of fact, I got involved in one. I didn't know I was getting involved in one back, um, I think the beginning of this year, maybe the end of last year, but it bleeded over into this year. It was an agent, uh, it was a property that I targeted to an agent, and it was her actual father's property. And so when I got to the house, you know, the price worked or everything, boom. So, and I had a buyer for it. So we put on the contract, whatever. And she revealed that, you know, as we put on the contract, that this was a short sale. So we basically had to, we were basically making an offer to the bank, not to our father. And so 60 days later, we offered 50 
which was the number that was going to work for my buyer and me getting paid. Well, I was going to make two, two grand on it. And um, they come back at 88000 The bank did. 60 days went by. So if you're going to do short sales, understand that that was a simple process. Normally, it's not that simple the way that happened. Understand that you're going to have to do a lot of them to get one deal that works for you. And you're going to have to have a, you know, you have to for the nag of that where and you have to have the buyer ready to go also on that. So now if I had six deals like that and one of them worked out, boom. But, you know, they're time consuming. You got to have a lot of patience. If you're going to do them, if they come my way and I can, we can get a decision from the bank quickly, yeah, I'll do it. You know, but all this waiting and stuff, I don't have the patience for it. But obviously people making it, they, they run their entire business around those opportunities. It just doesn't fit me. So I know I rambled there, but I hope I answered your question. JG says, how do I make a commercial seller take me serious? First thing is, normally you're going to be dealing with a broker, not really a seller, but sometimes you'll deal directly with the seller. You have to have the attitude. I don't care if it's commercial or single family. If you got $100 million in the bank and you don't care if they do it or not, now you do know it. With houses, it's not that difficult to know more than the seller that you're probably talking to. But with commercial, it takes a little bit more effort. The main thing, you have to know what you're talking about. That goes a long way in commercial. You have to be able to talk the lingo. That's it. You going to, That's the main thing. But again, on top of that, you got to have that attitude. I don't care if you do it or not. I'm not here to be interviewed. They start asking you how many properties you own. Is this a job interview or do we want to talk about buying and selling this property? I'm not here wasting my time. What do you think I'm, this is, you're being punked or something? You know, you, if you have to come off to them like that, so be it. There's plenty of deals out there. Don't feel like you're, you're obligated just to deal with this seller. And you know, you want to be nice to everyone, but when they try to handle you, oh, I, I get an attitude quick. But I, don't, I really don't care. You know what I'm saying? You should have to say that because there's just too many opportunities out there. So the main thing is you got to know what you're talking about. That, that's with commercial. You got to at least sound like you know what you're talking about, even though you may not have a dime in the bank. So now that's, my, that's my opinion. All right, Cynthia says, what happens when there's a mortgage still on the property? Does the buyer assume the mortgage? Sorry, I missed if you already answered. No, it's fine, Cynthia. If the property has a mortgage on it, uh, how much do they owe? What is the price that you need? And what I mean by that is if, if, the, if the price that you need is $50,000 and they owe $28,000, deal. And if they'll accept you know, something you know, below that, deal. Well, or if they accept the fifty thousand dollars and they owe twenty, so that means they'll leave the closing table with twenty-two. If my math is correct, deal. But if your number is fifty thousand dollars and they owe sixty-five thousand dollars, no deal. They're not going to come to the closing table with the difference of fifteen thousand dollars. So the mortgage matters, but it doesn't matter as long as that balance is less than the amount that you need to make the number work, and the sellers. Is, is, agreeing with you on the number that you need to make it work. So that, that's how mortgage or any liens work. They just need to be less than the amount of the number that works for you. And the seller obviously agreeing to, to accept your number, your price is what I mean. All right, the hen dog says, by the way, I've never done a deal. I'm super new to the business. Hey man, we all were new at some point. You know, we're all new at some point. All right, Nicholas Lofter says the best ways to find someone outside of and tell us or people search. Do you have any suggestions? Well, with and tell us and people search now. Don't ever sleep on possible relatives is how they term it, because you may be able to easier you may you may be able to find relatives easier than than the uh, actual person that you're looking for. You can reach out to that relative to see if they would contact the person, you give them some incentive and provide your contact information so they can call you about the property. So that's the first thing I'll use when, even with those services. 
The other thing you can do is just go out there and ask the nosy neighbors. You know, do they know the owner of that property? Do they know how to reach them? Again, give them some incentive, $500, $1,000, if you do a deal on the property um, for, for just providing that lead. So that's what I would, that's what I would do. Pamela Don says, Ty, how did you get your spouse on board with the idea of wholesaling? Pamela Don, when I started this, I had a girlfriend and let me see Well, that that's 2003, but Little did I know we were on the verge of breaking up within that same year. But to answer your question, uh, and I, I'm not married, so I can't really answer it in the sense of a spouse, but she was all with it, uh, when, especially when I showed up, you know, when I made that first $2,500, you know, but hey, she didn't stick around. So we, she and I are still friends today, you know, 14 plus years later. But uh, I don't know how to answer that, uh, Pam. Um, I know people have struggled with that, you know, because of, I guess some factors may be, oh my, some factors that may go beyond them getting into the business of just their relationship and um, them trying other businesses that didn't work out and so on. So, you know, all those things, things will factor in. So there's no, no cut and dry answer on that. Um, everybody's situation on that because you may, may be making a sacrifice financially or, or so on. Now, what I would probably do, I, I don't know, I, you know, it, it's just difficult for me to answer that question because of the way uh, or the type of, you know, the ladies that I date, you know, they already know going in who I am, what I am, you know what I'm saying? So, um, I, it's hard to answer that question, <laughs> but I don't have an answer, baby. I don't have an answer for you. Um, wow, that, that's a deep question, Pam. I hate to just move on from it because that's a lot of people's dilemma. I, I guess the thing that I would do, because normally it comes down to not really you doing it, but the money you're spending to do it. And it may be taken away from your house. So I know your situation is different. Sometimes it's not the money, they just don't want you to do it. But um, so if it's the money, I mean, it's based on the money, because like other stuff, you get in all kind of relationship stuff. But if it's just the money, uh, then, uh, you know, produce another way to do something, to pick up a second job, you know, to take care of that part of the, that, that business. So um, that, that's what I would do. I don't know what argument they can bring to the table at that point unless it's just time. The other job is time consuming or whatever. It doesn't fit into the schedule. But I, I don't know. That's a difficult question to answer, Pam. Um, so, so what we got here? Carissa, after the 200 signs, do you keep buying the banner sign and, and putting them up even if they're still up? No, nah, if, if you still got 200 signs up, Carissa, Man, and you're not getting any calls. Some something ain't right, you know. Uh, I would still buy more signs, you know. I would, but something is missing in that equation. That the majority of those signs are still up. Woo. Um, now you have to factor in how large your market is. I'm assuming it's a decent sized city, because it's all about eyeballs and how many people are viewing your message. But uh, that's the name of the game. If they're still staying up, hey, that's Normally a beautiful thing. All right, Gerald uh, Dilworth. Ty, is it a good or bad idea to partner with a family member starting out? What I'm going to say is, unless you need them for the financial side of it, as far as producing your marketing costs or whatever, but your marketing budget, I'm going to say no. And now if you got a family member that wants to do it also, then they just need to do it also, not with you all doing stuff together, in my opinion. Um, that's just me, because you don't actually need a partner at all to do this. Been in a husband and wife team, that's more that's more or less forced. So so I understand that. But actually needing a partner, no, no. Especially a family member. That that always I'm gonna always shun against that because if it go if if, if the business goes negative, a lot of times, you know, 
that that could cause some serious issues within within a family or even a friendship. All right, I'm sorry, I missed Paris Atkins. Uh, what's the normal time frame of putting up signs and getting calls? Uh, it's probably not really the normal time frame. It's a threshold that you normally will reach. Uh, you're doing an effective job of putting out signs. Probably 50 to 75 signs out normally will start to generate some calls. If you can keep a majority of them, once you get over the 150 uh, sign mark and the majority of those up, at least 100 are still up, then that, starts, that should start producing a steady stream of calls. So, and you want to stagger those. You don't want to go crazy and put out 100 at one time or 50 at one time. You want to test your marker. The worst thing you want to happen is put out 50 or 100 signs and they all come down the next day. That, that is horrible. Been there, done that. Alex uh, Suarez says, what's your take on marketing for motivated sellers through Craigslist? Uh, tough, tough sale, uh, but it's free. So keep posting but it's tough to find a, a steady stream of leads there. Larry Taylor's, that's what I'm dealing with right now. I assume he was referring to the spouse thing. Uh, JL Deal, what says, um, okay, I already answered that one. All right, Jonathan Phillips says, I live in California and want to go to my county courthouse to get files on probate homes and can use a double code on probate homes. Yeah, if you want to, uh, yes, that wouldn't be an issue. I'm an assignment guy, but yeah, that, that wouldn't be an issue. Uh, Mr. Gigi said, I have a commercial property. I have a broker representing it. Uh, it's a bank foreclosure. Is there a way uh, to get around him when bringing commercial buyers to uh, view and negotiate price to wholesale it? Um, it's going to be difficult with that broker involved if he has to show it every time. Your buyer has to be on the same page with you, uh, understanding your position if you have it on the contract. So it's really, it's really controlling your buyer and them being okay with you, with your position as far as a wholesaler. So it's possible, but your buyer has, is gonna have to be on board with you. I got a, uh, Eddie Porter says, I, I got a deal in a hood that's dead. Should I take it? When you say a hood that's dead, I'm assuming you mean a lot of vacant properties or whatever, if that's the case, then nah, you need to probably pass on that. You know, it's all about the visual, the curb appeal, man. Ty, do you own an apartment complex? No, not currently. Carissa Harden says, how many banner signs a week to put out? A minimum of 50 if you can. But again, you want to test first before you, you um, get on that schedule. But 50 is ideal a week. If you can do more, do more, but 50 is ideal per week. All right, Davin Davis says, I'm a licensed realtor that came across an absentee-owned vacant house, four houses down from a property I just sold. It has the owner's mailing address listed, but when I look it up, someone else owns it. Mm, that's gonna be something I would probably just check at the courthouse directly with. I was even look at their website. <clears throat> you may want to even go down there and ask someone directly and they may be able to give you a better answer on that, on what's the situation. So if the seller, I'm, I'm, if you're talking to the actual owner of the property, I'll just ask them why is it showing someone else's name different? If you're dealing directly with the owner of the property, you can actually communicate with them is what I'm saying. So that's what I, that's what I would do. Well guys, we're an hour and a half in, gonna go ahead and wrap this up. I really appreciate everyone that's come out this week. We did six through 10. So hopefully we'll knock out 11 through 15 next week. I was thinking about, and you all, you guys can comment on this video afterwards once it goes live, probably take about an hour, about just doing just a question and answer period and letting the topic go. So you guys tell me how you feel about that. You know, I can go, you know, 30 minutes to 45 minutes on just Q&A on these flipping R. You know, we don't have to go through the rest of it. You know, I'm here to, here to please, you know, to satisfy whatever, because if this is more valuable to individuals, just to listen to the question and answer period, then hey, we'll, we'll rock and roll with that. So you guys can just let me know, not here in the chat uh, more so, but in the comments section, if you see this later on, uh, whether you're on this live flip or not. Or not. So and we'll, and we'll roll with it. So again, I appreciate everyone that's come out Tonight, if you have more questions from this, if I don't answer them, just post them in the comments later on when the video goes live. 
and um, and I'll definitely answer them for you. So appreciate everyone again coming out. Please share this. Let others know. We'll see you on the flip side.